Hey everyone, this is Nick, and if you're a longtime follower of the channel, you know about my quest to try and remove as many Google services from my life as possible. And yeah, I know it's ironic to publish that on YouTube, but there is no real alternative just yet. I mean, I'm on Odyssey and some of my videos are on Peertube, but that's just not the same audience. I have successfully removed a ton of Google-related stuff from my life, from Google Search, Gmail, Google Drive, Google Docs, but there's still an area where I just can't find a replacement, and that's Android. I used EOS, or slash E slash OS, for a long while, but it was lacking a few features, especially safety net support, which meant that a lot of applications just wouldn't work at all. Well, this de-googled Android ROM that I used to use now has a new 1.0 release. And on paper, it fixes all my issues with it, and it also adds a bunch of privacy-related features on top. So let's see if it can live up to its promises. What definitely delivers on their promises to keep your internet connection safe and secure is Safing, today's sponsor. This video is sponsored by Safing. They make the Portmaster, which is an amazing tool that lets you control and monitor your internet connection with a simple graphical user interface. You get block lists, you get profiles depending on your current connection, and you can even tweak settings per app. It's also completely open source and free. Safing also makes the SPN, or Safing Privacy Network. It's a powerful VPN alternative, which spreads your connections across the globe instead of rerouting all your connections to only one server. With the SPN, you can be everywhere at once, and no website can build a profile from your visits and your location. Of course, you also get all the benefits from a traditional VPN. If that's something you'd like to try, and if you want to help support Safing's open source work, you can subscribe to the SPN right now, or download the Portmaster by heading in the link in the description below. So, slash E slash OS, or EOS. While the name might be super dumb and basically impossible to look up on the internet, it still hides a very, very nice Android ROM. It's based on Lineage OS, but it goes a lot further than this one in terms of de-googling the operating system. They don't just replace the default apps with their own, all based on open source applications, and the launcher with their own iOS-like version, but they also remove the connectivity check that calls home to Google, as well as the time servers that let Google track you. They let you change the DNS servers. They removed the Google Play services and replaced them with Micro-G, an open source implementation that now does pass safety net check reliably, and they don't use a Google account by default. But that leaves you without a lot of what makes Google interesting, right? A lot of their services. Well, not exactly, because Slash E also offers a bunch of online services you can use. They offer users what they call Marina Cloud. Marina being the global brand that regroups the OS, the services, and the smartphones they sell. Marina Cloud is basically a Nextcloud instance, complete with your own email address, your calendar and contacts, an online cloud storage space, and an online office suite, namely OnlyOffice. You only get one gigabyte for free, as the nonprofit is pretty small and they just don't have the same scale as Google. But you can go up to two terabytes, although the prices are pretty steep, at 25 euros per month for that kind of storage. And now you might be saying, that's just giving all your data to someone other than Google, so what's the point? Well, first, this account is optional. You can perfectly plug in any other services you prefer to use. And second, they don't scan the data, they don't log application usage, they don't use ads, and so they have no incentive or project to sell your data to anyone. It's all completely private. And it's also really well integrated right at the beginning when you boot up your phone, and it's accessible from any other OS, including Linux, as a normal Nextcloud account. Basically, it's the promise of a fully integrated one-login ecosystem that I've been clamoring for for a long while. Okay, so what does EOS 1.0 specifically bring compared to other Android systems? Well, the Marina team was nice enough to send me a Fairphone 4 as a review unit, running slash EOS 1.0. I'll take a look at the smartphone itself in a few minutes, but let's first take a look at the OS. The launcher hasn't really changed much since I last used EOS a few years ago. It's still a grid of apps, very iOS-like, without an app drawer. I personally prefer this layout, although the launcher defaults to the three-button navigation layout. You can change it to the newer gestures, which I think works better for me. 
Swiping to the left gives you access to widgets. You can't place them directly on your home screen. They're all located in that side view. Now that's something iOS used to do, but nowadays even they allow you to place widgets directly on your home screen. And that's something I wish the slash E team put inside their launcher as well. It's just much more practical and powerful and customizable. By default, in that side view, you get a search bar, a view of how much storage you're using in your Marina Cloud account, the weather, and the new advanced privacy feature. So let's talk about that. This is a feature that, to the best of my knowledge, is exclusive to slash EOS, and that lets you hide your IP address, provide a fake location, and denies all trackers. It will show you a graph of all blocked trackers, and you can manage these per app to see which app tried to track you and with what. You also get access to the app's permissions, and you can select another location if you don't want it to be randomized. Your IP address can also be changed to appear from another country if you prefer, and you can enable or disable that feature for each app. It's an amazing addition to make sure that even if an app manages to grab some data, it's going to be completely unusable. It can be coupled with an alias email to hide your real email, and it just makes you feel safer and just more private when browsing the phone. It can also serve as a VPN of sorts, although weirdly, the system uses Mapbox, which is detected as a tracker inside of this app privacy page. Now that's all well and good, but what about the apps? What made me drop slash EOS in the past was the fact that micro G services just didn't cut it, and a lot of apps didn't work because SafetyNet didn't work either. If you don't know what it is, SafetyNet is a security solution implemented by Google to ensure the integrity of the OS. Incidentally, it's also a way to ensure that manufacturers do make use of Google services and of the Play Store. There was also the issue that a lot of applications weren't available or failed to open without an error. Turns out slash EOS 1.0 claims to have fixed that. And in my tests, they did. Instead of the Google Play Store, you get the App Lounge. It looks like the Aurora Store, and it's probably a fork of it, but it contains most, if not all, the Android apps you'll find on Google Play, including paid ones. The App Lounge allows you to log in anonymously or using a Google account, the latter being here mostly to let you restore your purchases and to buy paid apps. If you don't want or need these things, then you don't need a Google account on the App Lounge and not provide any data. That's the option I chose. I downloaded a bunch of apps, including my banking app, Twitter, Firefox, YouTube, Game Pass, Freeletics, or YouTube Music, and they all worked flawlessly, as you would expect. Even the Samsung Galaxy Wearable app worked perfectly and allowed me to connect to my Galaxy Buds and my Galaxy Watch Active 2, which didn't work previously on the, the older versions of Slash E. You would basically never notice that you're not using the Google Play services at all. The App Lounge still retains its privacy ratings, giving a score out of 10 for each app, powered by Exodus Privacy, so you can know before installing if the app will try to track you and with what. It's definitely a way better experience than when I used Slash E before in the past. All my apps are there, everything works out of the box, you just click install and it installs and it works. I guess using a 1.0 stable release does make a difference. The consistency of the OS was also something that felt off to me back in the day, with default apps having a riot of colors and different user interfaces. And while things aren't perfect just yet, they're a lot better now. All default apps use a light blue color and look more like part of a whole coherent experience than the disjointed collection of apps they were before. Dark mode support is also fully implemented in all the apps, which wasn't the case before and you can customize your experience by choosing the style of the icons used by the system, an accent color, the icon's shape, and you can even save these styles to quickly switch between them. Customization options? Why didn't anybody tell me we entered KDE land here? In terms of internals, EOS is still based on Lineage 18.1, so it's on Android 11, but it does have all the latest security patches and gets updated regularly. Of course, the experience isn't as powerful by default as other Android phones or OSs, because the launcher is quite simple. But there's nothing stopping you from installing any launcher you want to replace it, like Nova Launcher, for example. They're all in the App Lounge. So yeah, the experience with EOS 1.0 for the past few days has been really excellent. It's all coherent, it's secure, it's more private than alternative ROMs, 
and it just feels like a lot of thought has been put into it. And you can still customize everything to your liking. It's a winner in my book. Now, I'm less excited about the Fairphone 4. While I absolutely love the mission behind this phone, it doesn't feel like a device that suits my needs. So first, if you don't know about it, the Fairphone initiative has very noble goals at its heart. The phones are made with recyclable materials. They have a five year warranty. They're certified fair trade and they're neutral in terms of electronic waste. The Fairphones have an iFixit score of 10 out of 10. It doesn't use any glue and you can repair it yourself and buy the repair parts freely. Take that, Apple. It's extremely nice to see this initiative. And I love the concept of using a phone that you know will last a long time and have a very minimal impact on the world, including in how it's made and how the workers are compensated. But as a tech nerd that likes to change phones and devices regularly, it just doesn't suit my purposes. You, you can really feel there are some trade-offs here. First, it's pretty heavy at 228 grams compared to 168 grams for my already too big Samsung Galaxy S21. Second, the screen. It's full HD, more than enough for a phone. Seriously, 4K screens on a phone, it's just a waste of battery life and you'll never notice the difference unless you pixel peep with your eyes glued to the screen. But the screen doesn't have high refresh rate. And after using a phone and a tablet and a PC screen that run at least at 100 Hz, the return to 60 Hz is brutal. Everything feels a bit sluggish and stuttery. And the size of the display is much too big for my tastes at 6.3 inches, although that will be a matter of personal preference. A lot of people love big phones. Make smaller Android phones, you cowards! 6.3 inches is too big! For a phone! It's too big for a phone! The Fairphone 4 uses a Snapdragon 750G with 5G support. It has 6 to 8 gigabytes of RAM depending on the storage, either 128 gigs or 256 gigs. The battery is 3900 milliamp hours and definitely lasts the whole day without any problems, especially when you block all trackers that use your internet connection in the background. The cameras are pretty good with dual 48 megapixel on the back at f1.6 and f2.2 aperture so you get a wide angle and the selfie camera is 25 megapixel at f2.2 with a small notch. They all produce good clear images without most of the post-processing most manufacturers apply so they won't smooth your face like Samsung does or tweak the colors. Again it's a matter of personal preference but I could absolutely live with these cameras no problem. They even have an advanced image stabilization for video and night mode. The phone itself comes in green, gray or speckled green. I got the gray variant and you can add a charger and cable optionally if you don't already have them. It uses USB-C, obviously. What manufacturer in its right mind would not use USB-C in their own smartphones in 2022? Oh wait. Now the price is pretty high too for these specs at 579 euros. But that's the price you pay for a sustainable phone with a huge warranty and repairability. You also get a fingerprint reader to unlock it. I love the idea behind this phone, but there are too many trade-offs in terms of size, of weight, of bezel size, of screen refresh rate. It's just not for me. But if you don't care about these technical details and you're okay with paying a premium for a sustainable phone, then it's really, really good. What if you don't want a fair phone, but you like EOS? Well, you can do that as well. After all, I used it on a Galaxy S8 Plus before. Also a phone that's way too big. They have three ways to get EOS. First, you have their online store, where they offer a variety of devices, including the Fairphone 3 and 4, Galaxy S9s and S9 Plus, as well as the TerraCube 2 and the Marina 1, which is their own smartphone that's also mid-range and currently out of stock, but very affordable. They ship these to the EU, Canada and the US. Second, you can use their easy installer. It's available on Linux and Windows and only supports a few devices, but it will guide you step by step, download what you need automatically and do all the background work for you. It's a 30 minute to one hour procedure that's really easy with graphics and detailed instructions. And finally, if your device isn't supported by the easy installer, you can just flash EOS on a lot of phones. And I mean a lot, from plenty of manufacturers. It's more manual work and it might be trickier, but if you're already used to flashing Android ROMs, it will be easy enough to follow the various instructions that are also pretty detailed. 
If you're not used to flashing Android ROMs like me, things will largely depend on your phone manufacturer. If you have a Samsung phone, get ready to pull your hair, as if I had enough to do that. So what do I think about this new release of EOS? Well, I loved it before and I only abandoned it because some apps didn't work. Now they do work and all my small issues with it are fixed. I still think the default experience is great as I always found Android way too convoluted for my tastes with thousands of settings and things everywhere and EOS fixes that. So yeah, I could definitely see myself coming back to EOS, but the Fairphone doesn't cut it for me. My Samsung Galaxy S21 isn't supported. So I would have to look specifically for a decently recent phone with high refresh rate displays and that's not too big. But if I can find that and that's supported by EOS, I will definitely move back to it. I just love it. EOS just has that safe feeling. You know you're in control of what data companies grab from your smartphone. Something I've always struggled with on Android and iOS. The fact I can use my own Nextcloud account if I want to, or that it has great integrated online services is a plus. And since it uses open source apps by default, I also feel a bit more free in my use of Android. If you're looking to escape Google even on your smartphone, then I don't think there's any better ROM than EOS. It's more private than other custom Android ROMs, it's safe, the experience is really good, and it has basically all the apps you might ever want. It's got my seal of approval. Just like today's sponsor, Tuxedo. Tuxedo is based in Germany. They make laptops and desktops that ship with Linux out of the box. You can select a bunch of distros on their website along a ton of other configuration options, including your own logo on the back, and you can be certain that any other distro will just run on it because the hardware is 100% Linux compatible. They have a huge range of devices from the smallest NUX to the biggest gaming PCs, towers or laptops or workstation laptops like the Stellaris 15 I just received as a review unit. They've got basically every keyboard layout you might want, they ship worldwide and they have interesting projects as well, such as for example an external water cooling solution for the newest Stellaris 15 laptop. Basically you plug it in at the back and it's gonna water cool your laptop so the dedicated Nvidia GPU can work at its maximum potential. It's pretty cool. So if you need a device that you can be sure runs Linux 100%, head over to the link in the description below, click it and grab yourself a tuxedo device. They're really cool. So thanks everyone for watching the video. I hope you enjoyed it. If you did, don't hesitate to like, to subscribe, to turn on notifications, to write a comment. And if you didn't, you can also dislike it and tell me why in the comments as well. And if you're part of the 1% and you've got all that money weighing you down, you can give some to me using the PayPal link in the description or the super thanks button at the bottom of this video. Or you can join my Patreon subscribers and my YouTube members. Both get access to a weekly Patreon cast and the right to vote on the next topics I'll cover. So thanks everyone for watching and I'll see you in the next one. Bye.